Hello everybody and welcome to today's podcast. I've got on with me today the co-founder of For Recruitment, Claire Sofield. Thanks for joining me, Claire. Thank you. It's going to be um, another interesting podcast because I've known you a long time, so I know that I know the the level of honesty that's going to go with this um, yeah. with this podcast, which only which always brings about it great learnings. And you've had quite a, I think you've had a rare journey, right? Because you made a strategic decision that we're talk, going to talk about on there to do with parenting. Um, where that that very few people, in fact, or. or, or I don't even think I've known anybody who's taught, who I know who's took that decision. So we're going to talk about a number of things. We're going to talk about that and what it's like being a single mum. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about a meeting we had probably 2018, where you kind of were with your business, compared to where it's perceived. And I'll talk about kind of that fear that I live with. I'll also talk about, by the way, the guilt I live with, with having four kids and um, and having to parent those, and even though you know I've got a partner, I still feel like I've got to do my mm-hmm. bit and do I do enough? I don't know, which I suppose is going to be a topic of this conversation. And um, and in fact, let's just get started, right, Claire? And I want to talk about your drive, yeah, because you are one of the most driven people I've come across, um, and we'll find out where that's come from. So and how that's maintained um, since I've met you. So let's really just start. Let's start at the, we'll just start pre our 2018 okay. meeting. You're a local group in, was it Bolton? Bolton, yeah. Right. And um, you went, what was you like at school? What was you like? Um, so at primary school, I was Were you pretty, a bossy kid? Uh, do you know what? I think I wasn't, but actually other people tell me that right. I was. So clearly my memory is not as good. So I was pretty diligent at primary school, um, was always pretty academic um towed the line that definitely changed as I got older but yeah I was you know I was yeah I was diligent was you sporty? I was not massively primary maybe but secondary definitely not not massively um I guess um a, a life event not not a good one happened when I was 10 so I lost my dad when I was 10 so mm-hmm. that was um that was really tough and definitely comes on probably to some of my story and my drive and my why and stuff. So that that was a real game changer because up until that point, I'd had a really comfortable life. My dad had his own business. Mm-hmm. We never wanted for anything. And at the age of 10, my whole world collapsed. Yeah both not having a dad, but also financially a house got repossessed. So there's a lot from my childhood that's definitely kind of shaped where I am today. As I kind of got through secondary school, um, I went to Bolton School um, yeah. but on a fully assisted place because my mum couldn't afford it after my dad died. Um, that was amazing from an education perspective. Um, and it, my, I think my mum, it ticked a massive box for my mum because she knew that I was in a safe place almost at school. Yeah. Um, but that's also contributed to my drivers because I had, when I look back, a real inferiority complex. So my best mates now, I'm from Bolton School, amazing yeah. from that perspective. But I was around people that at the age of 11 and 12, I just thought were better than me. Yeah. But I thought they were better than me because effectively they had more money. Yeah. And and that was really tough. I couldn't do anything that they did, school trips, even go out weekends and stuff, go shopping when you're 12, 13. Um, so I definitely felt quite um, different to everybody else. How did else. you cope with that back then? Um, not very well, actually. Um, my mum, um, part of the story, but passed away eight years ago. Now, we had an amazing relationship, but it was really volatile. In my teen, teens, I had so much anger. And I mean, like, you know, verbal anger, but physical anger. I'd scream, I'd shout, I'd throw things around because I was just gutted that I didn't have my dad. Our lifestyle financially was 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 bad. You yeah. know, I got my first job at the age of fourteen. I earned two pound twenty an hour, so yeah. I'm showing my age. Yeah. And every single penny went to my mum. And we, and this is no exaggeration. At the end of a week, my mum would count up how much money she had if she could afford a loaf of bread. Like that is how yeah, shit yeah. it was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was really angry. Didn't. Um, Academically, I mean, I maintained more or less, yeah. you know, the education side, and I ticked that box. But yeah, I through through my teens, I didn't go off the rails like in terms of drugs. I've never taken a drug in my yeah. life. I maybe went off the rails a little bit in terms of 
guys and that side mm. of my life, which my mum wasn't very happy with when I had a 22 year old boyfriend at the age of 17, that yeah. did not go down well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it, it was a difficult time in my teens, definitely. And when you, and, and so you left there, did you leave at 18 or? 18, yeah. Um, what did what did what did you what did you want to do? What was your thoughts? Um, so always, kind of the route was university. Didn't really right. you know look at any other options yeah. then. Um, and actually, it was probably through sixth form where I got a bit of a voice, okay. where I felt like I could. And I remember speaking to some of the people um, in my like who I'd grown up with at secondary school, and just kind of saying, "I I don't think you were very nice to me." Um, and I did I did find a bit of voice uh, of a voice in my sixth form, and then at university that continued to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, did an English language degree. Had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, thought maybe about journalism. Um, finished uni. I did get some like hardship grants and stuff, but a lot of debt because my mum wasn't in a position to support yeah. me. I worked throughout. I mean, yeah. the, nowhere near the debt that people come out yeah, of uni yeah, with yeah. now, but still yeah. quite a lot back yeah. then. Um, and then, yeah, at that point, it was like, obviously need to go straight into work. Um, no option to have gap years or whatever from a financial perspective. And my brother worked in recruitment. We weren't dissimilar in character. Um, and I went to Hayes, actually, just for some temp work, a temp admin work to see yeah. me over. And they said, if you thought about recruitment, I was like, well, my brother's in it, maybe. And then I got a few job offers. And then I think my brother thought, well, you can't be that bad. Because um, I was this known, he, I was his little sister back then. Yeah, yeah. And then we had a conversation and I went to the business that he worked at, but in a different office and I remember him saying to me you do know it's hard work because I'd done about five hours at uni yeah. for the last five hours a week for for the last three years he was like it's really hard recruitment it's long days I'm like yeah yeah, yeah. I can I can do yeah. it and that's effectively where it started right and when you when you went into the, that job it was a sales role wasn't yeah. it yeah yeah <clears throat> How was that early doors? Did you really take to it and think this is a bit of me or? Yeah, I did. I did. I, you know, then kind of recruitment was super old school. My manager was sat next to me. It was like 100 calls a week was expectation in terms of 100 physical clients you speak to. Bam, bam, bam on the phone it wasn't quite phone book era but it was that kind of approach yeah. and yeah I did I think it sounds a really silly stat to say but in 10 weeks I did temp recruitment back then yeah. in 10 weeks I got to 10 temps which was like a really good achievement and yeah I, 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 I loved it I remember the first time somebody was rude to me I was like oh my god and I took it so personally I mean that resilience had to grow pretty yeah, yeah, quickly yeah. in recruitment and sales yeah. but yeah I did I did take to it really was well was competitive um Oh, it's so hard to look back. It feels like a lifetime ago. Mm. Yes, I joined at the same time as somebody, else, as somebody else and I was always like, what are they doing? Where am I at? So, yeah, I've always wanted to be the best at something. Yeah. And so how many years did you do in employment? I did about four years. Right? Yeah. And then how did four recruitment come about? So my brother... Um, he's eight years older than me, Philip. He um, had worked, like I say, in a different office in the same company. He'd got to a point where he was a bit sick of lining somebody else's yeah. pockets, wanted to take the good stuff he'd learned and, and kind of put his stamp on it. And I went for lunch with him at the Slug and Lettuce on Albert Square in Manchester. And I knew he was planning on doing it with, with somebody else. And I thought, well, when I'm a bit older, maybe ha when I've got a family, want a bit of an easier life, um, I might go work for him. And that's yeah. as far as I went. And yeah. then we went for lunch and he was like, this is nuts. Like, why don't you get involved? And, you know, the phrase ignorance is bliss mm -hmm. is, um, is, is a good one to use here. And I was like, yeah, why not? Because I had no mortgage, no kids, no commitments. So I just thought the worst that could have happened is it didn't work. I'd go back to my previous employer who I had a really good, you know, relationship with. And, you know, that they're just, I don't know. I, I, for me, the, the the risk was minimal because I knew I could go back and work yeah. for someone else. So, and, and was your involvement at the start the same as it is now? So you started. Uh, yes, in terms of like equal, we had two others originally, hence the name four. Yeah. And um, yes, in terms of like equal shareholding and from that perspective, but my roles changed quite yeah. a lot in the last yeah. fifteen years, nearly. You mentioned then I didn't know that that you had four. What yes. happened the, to the other two? Um. So they fell by the wayside. Um, so I'm trying to think the right way to articulate this. So the first person... Um, Truthfully. <laughs> um, he, effectively, he wanted a lifestyle business and that has never been part of our game plan. Yeah. We wanted to grow a business of scale, a business we were really proud of with a real kind of legacy behind it um, and what needed to be put in in those early days just, just 
Mm. We weren't on the same page effectively. So about Mm. four years in, that kind of came to an end. And then the other person was our finance director, Paul. So he was an equal shareholder, but worked on like a consultant basis amazing when we first set up we we put in our own money but we got a loan from rbs if it had been down to me philip and al we would not have got that loan we were like literally shaking yeah. Yeah. in yeah. the room our initial business plan was literally a book paul was like what are you doing no it needs to be a page or two yeah. pages yeah. so he was great instrumental pretty tight on the purse strings what you need when you set a business up not getting too carried away but probably i think it was about five six years ago i just kind of got to a point where i thought what Philip and I were putting in versus what Paul was, it just wasn't, it just wasn't equal. Um, and that therefore needed to be changed from a shareholding perspective. Mm. Um, so that was super amicable. Paul's great. We still kind of follow each other on social media, but his role, we just got to a point where yeah. we didn't need him. And that's probably around about the time we started engaging with you guys, to be yeah. fair. I'm going to go back a minute yeah. to the first one that left. Um, okay. Only because, and only because... Um, A constant repetition I see is people set up a business and there's two or there's three or there's four. A lot of the times there's three. And and there's always a point where that relationship starts to break down. Mm. But they find it difficult to unravel. And I had the same. So I've had a Sajulo version one with a guy. Yeah. And um, he was my boss. When I said I was leaving, he said, oh, I'll come and do it with you. I said, Fine. It was 50-50, but in reality, he still had that boss nature, so he's telling me what to do. And it became competitive, but not in a... Sometimes you can be competitive and you just... It creates like a, a thrive. This was like... I felt like it was how do I pull Paul back because he's so competitive, which I am, that he's like on another level really trying to destroy his own business partner, which I don't think was the truth. Mm. I just wanted to build something great. But uh, in any case... We ended up pretty quickly unraveling that. And it, there wasn't an argument involved, but we've not spoke since. Mm. And that was 13 years ago. Um, I'm so glad that that ended, right? Yeah. Because I see so many businesses just drifting because the team can't be all heading in the same direction. The boat's not going in the same yeah. direction because the leadership team aren't. And unfortunately, that comes at some point where you have to have difficult conversations and get on with it for the betterment of every individual around the management team Mm. and more so for the betterment of an organisation and the people in it. So let's just go back to how you've dealt with those situations. So you had your first situation with... Without, yeah. yeah. How, How did you instigate that? Probably that one wasn't dealt with as well um, and dragged out longer than it should have done. And I'm going to kind of blame, you know, my and Philip's naivety on that, really, because we never set up a business before. Mm. You don't know how it's going to pan out. And I think the one lesson that I've learned is who you go into business with is is so key. And we might come on to the me and my brother situation. And whilst, you know, it's not, always roses and there'll be things we disagree on we're family we've got each other's backs we're cut from the same cloth like we will do anything for each other and mm. we certainly won't shaft each other mm. whereas in a different relationship it's not it's it's not always that that plain sailing so yeah when i look back we, we kind of tried to find with Al a, 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 a solution to the problem which was setting up a separate legal company but actually that still wasn't being driven in the way that we wanted mm. to it was meaning that that market then was kind of closed off to the main business. Yeah. But then that market wasn't getting, you know, maximised as much as yeah. it could do. So it probably took too long to reach that decision. And that was massive naivety because I'm like, I don't know mm. what we need to do to buy someone out, how it all works. So I think that probably came to an end in about 2000 and I want to say 13, 14 okay. time. 13 maybe. And when did you set up? 2008. Right. And yeah, similar. There wasn't a fallout, but I haven't spoken to him since. So yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's yeah, a yeah. similar story. With the Paul, no, that situation, I was much more black and white. This is what needs to happen. I'm confident in the decision. 
I'll lead it, lead those negotiations. Now, again, I was a bit of a fish out of water because we were bigger then. So that was a proper valuation. Yeah. Paul's a finance director by trade. Yeah. So he's got knowledge I've not. So I had to very quickly speak to people and be like, right. And, you know, Paul valued our business based on revenue. Mm. And you'd never back value a business mm. based on mm. revenue, let mm. alone a recruitment company. Mm. But he, that was a starting point, mm. wasn't it? Yeah. And I think when he realized, look, I, I'm not naive anymore and I've done my research, he was a bit like, right, okay. And, and yeah. we kind of met in the middle and that and that was amicable. It, it's super amicable and I bumped into him today. It, 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 it'd be great. But I was much clearer then about this needs to happen. Yeah. Um, and it was much swifter, the process. So we met similar time yeah. around that yeah, area. Did, yeah. I think from memory, I, I met Paul. So maybe a yeah, year we after. Did, yeah. um, we sat down in about 2018. And I'll always remember the meeting because if you look, and it's very difficult this, because people who was talking before, they look at the brand, they look at a brand, mm. or they look at a person, and they always think the grass is greener. Yeah. So they'll look at Paul Cheatham and they'll think, oh, it's all right for him. They'll look at Sajulo and think, blah, blah, blah. And they'll think the same for Claire, and they'll think the same for Four. But underneath, there's always a fear of losing what you've built. Mm. And, and, I, and I always say this, like, first of all, if you're successful in business, that doesn't mean you'll always be successful in business because something can go wrong. And I think generally every business is about six months from going bust. Mm. You know, most businesses. Because a massive downturn in, in a recession now can take a strong business in a way COVID did. Yeah. We've seen with COVID, particularly in your sector, Terrible, terrible start of COVID for everything. And that doesn't matter how good your business was. Mm. The first three or four months of COVID from March 2020 was disastrous for every single recruitment business. Yeah. But then you see the market bounce back and now most recruitment agencies are buoyant. And part of that is undictated and out of your control. But oh, I've lost my train of thought now. But um, when we sat down in 2018... In 2018, I would say people thought for recruitment's robust, it's, it's, a, it's a good business. You'd started to build your profile. I'd heard about you'd come across you before, um, you, you, before you, you came in as a client. But actually, we sat down in 2018, and it was a bit like, I've been going 10 years at this. Yeah. Warts and all, here's where we are. Yeah. And, and when I say it wasn't pretty, it wasn't disastrous. It wasn't like... We're gonna go, you know. We're gonna go bust, but it was just like very underwhelming mm. from from your perspective, yeah, and unfulfilling. I think from your perspective, because yeah. you are very driven, which we'll come on into yeah. a minute. And I think from your brother, it was slightly different. I think he was more extremely worried, mm. and you was going through a period of um, your own personal stuff which we're going to talk about in a sec but you also was going through a culture change where actually let's talk about it you actually had one or two people who was controlling yeah. really culture yeah and it wasn't you two yeah talk me to me a little bit about the culture issue there yeah, the problem so that you i guess there were a few things just to backtrack slightly probably we probably got to about a mill turnover maybe after like four or five years so like mm. steady kind of organic growth and when i look back now from year five to year ten loosely which is kind of yeah. the 2018 time we didn't change a lot of what we did we kind of did the same well therefore the result will be the same there weren't any gear shifts almost which on reflection i look back and go oh my god why did we not do certain things sooner so we got to 2018 and there was a bit of a perfect storm you had a couple of key people leave which when we were probably back then 15 staff mm -hmm. and two-thirds of those were at maximum probably less actually were recruiters you lose a couple of people that bring in you a, qu a quarter of a million pounds yeah. each yeah that's a massive impact for a small business yeah we had a couple of people in the business that we'd allowed to be negative, mood hoovers, all those phrases that you hear, and that was starting to have a bit of an impact. We had some new people that take time to get up and running, and then we had some of my own personal stuff that was going on, which whilst I tried to play down the impact on, on the business back then, I was still directly revenue generating and, recruit, and recruiting and brought a shed load of clients in. So it was this perfect storm of shit. Like financially, we are not where we need to be. No, it wasn't at any point we're going to go under, mm. but it was like, 
we've worked for 10 years. This has been our whole life. It's anything but a lifestyle business. And mm. that was that um, bit of resentment and, and mm. not feeling fulfilled. It's anything but a lifestyle business. But are you kidding me? Yeah. Like we're at this point, we're not, at that year I don't think we made profit, mm. if I'm right in saying so. And we have worked our backsides off. Mm. And you just, well, I mean, I did. Like, mm. you just want to cry because mm. you're like, oh, my God, like, we can't do this for another 10 years. Like, you know, we, we, we couldn't carry on like that. Um, and, yeah, we were sat in the one of your boardrooms and... It was it was it was not a great place to be. Now I'm not just saying this because I'm doing your mm. podcast, but mm. whenever we have a meeting with you, even if the message that you're delivering yeah. and there was a subsequent meeting which we will come on to, isn't hugely positive, the way that you approach things and just your attitude and how you articulate stuff, we always leave feeling right. Okay, come on, we can do this. We can smash this. But yeah, we came into that meeting and it wasn't a great place to be, both in terms of that fulfilment, but also. I, for me, and um, I know you read some work textbooks and they talk about failure and how it's the making of you, so I I'm, don't necessarily agree with some of that. Yeah. Failure is not an option. Yeah. So at no point did I think the business was going to go under, because yeah. quite simply, I won't let that happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is no way that will happen. But there's a difference between a business not going under and then a business really kind of scaling and and and. I, I, I don't know, going in the direction yeah, it needs yeah. to. Um, so yeah, that combined with, and, and I know we're going to move on to this, but in 2018, back end of 17, I started to try to become a mum. Mm -hmm. And that carried on the whole of 2018, was physically, emotionally, and mentally draining. So when we were sat in that room, it was a, where's the business at? We've got people that we don't want in the business. We've got people that have left that ideally we wouldn't have liked to have le left. You've got this persona externally, like you said, whereby actually showing a chink in your armor could have negative implications. Yep. But it was actually around that point that I did think, and sorry if anyone's going to be offended, but I just thought, fuck it. Yeah. I'm just going to be honest about stuff. So yeah. I'm now so much more honest yeah. when things aren't so great in the business because it just shows you real as opposed to this almost veneer, which yeah. is we're smashing it. Yeah. Because we're not always smashing it. Yeah. So it's made me be more honest and more vulnerable, which actually has had a really positive impact on our business by by just being honest about mm. how things are. But yeah, it wasn't a good time. And um that was a bit of a it was a bit of a make or break meeting from a from a mindset perspective, I would say. Yeah. Well come on to your personal journey in a second. Uh but at that meeting, it's fair to say there was individuals of power within your organization. Yeah that were ruining the organization. And <clears throat> you find it time and time again, this isn't something unique to you. You find it time and time again where, and it's to different degrees. Sometimes I've got pretty much a zero tolerance now mm. of it. I haven't always had a zero tolerance of it. Um, actually listening to James Timpson in one of our Be The Standard things gave me some real clarity about Trying to have a high-performing environment and having moderate people won't work. Mm. Yours was beyond that. Yours was you're trying to create high performance because that's the individual you are. And you had people absolutely controlling what was going on. You subsequently let them left. Yeah. And I think you subsequently pushed or what however it went, other people left. At the time you thought. Certainly, your brother thought mm. if they left, what, what what are we left with? Can we can we go on? Can we continue? I don't know how. If it was a million quid then, and two of them was quarter of yeah. a million quid, you're really going back to what you was five years ago, which is tough to take. Mm. Um, but in reality, what happened? Um, well, we found a way again, and I remember yeah. um, sat in that meeting. Well, what if? What if? What if? Because those people, you know that. Would. Just explain that because it is very important. One person was leaving and it yeah. led to... And then it was like, but what's the impact on the other person? What's the impact on that? What will happen to the clients? What will happen to the revenue that they don't bring in? And when you're a small business, and the figures weren't as big then, to be fair, but they were still, let's say, 150, 200K revenue. Yeah. And that's like 20% of our business. And, you know, there's a tendency to go... But there's that... I was reading something last night. It's that whole fixed mindset, growth mindset, isn't it? And I've had a massive shift in that yeah. but what if but what if but what if right 
we can't control the what ifs. Mm. We can control how we deal with that situation and we'll find a way. And the last few years, we've well, we found more than a way. We're, you know, triple the size we were back in 2018, yep. which is what you're talking about. Yep. So I think just not, I always pronounce this word wrong, but making a catastrophe out of absolutely everything because all those things might not happen as a knock on the fence. And they didn't happen. And they didn't happen. Um, we dealt with the situation. Um, the aftermath was nowhere near as bad as we thought it would be. And we go again because intrinsically what we've got is a brand that we are, Philip and I are so proud of. Mm. Like, and, and it's so easy sometimes to forget that. But one of the key things we wanted to do when we set up was build a, a business in an industry that, let's be honest, doesn't have the best, best reputation. One that we can be really proud of and go to sleep at night knowing that we do things the right way. Yeah. And that still remained, you know, that ethos still remained and yeah. some people just didn't fit it. Yeah, it's that simple. So they need to move on. And honestly, since that episode, I'm trying to look back. There's not been anybody in the business that we've allowed to have that kind of negative impact. Yeah. And we've had, it's not really happened to be fair to that mm. degree. Mm. But if there's been anything, we've dealt with it there and then, yeah. rather than let things yeah. um, kind yeah. of unravel, yeah. which which we did a little bit. I think there was a point, I don't know how many, say it was 15 staff, yeah. I think the one point, the what if had got you down to about five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it was, yeah. well, when that happens, that's going to happen. And when that happens, that and before you know it, and we all do it. Yeah. The reality is it didn't. No, it didn't. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back to the business in a sec, because at the same time, you're also, you've also made a strategic personal decision. Yeah. Which was... So I love how you say strategic, but it was strategic. <laughs> it is strategic. It is strategic. So, yeah, I got to about the end of, mid to the end of 2017. I was 34, I think. Um, and I am not Mother Earth, just preempt this. I'm not the most maternal person you're ever going to meet, but I was not prepared to leave this planet, not experiencing mm. being a mum and mm. bringing another life into mm. the world. Like I just couldn't contemplate that. Um, after, a let's just say, a, a history of bad decisions when it came to um, my love life, I just thought, no, I need to take this into my own hands. So, and I knew I had some medical fertility kind of possible challenges. Went to um, a fertility clinic, got some tests done and stuff, and it was just far worse than anticipated. Um, and I was like, oh God, right, okay. And to be fair, when I set the business up at 25, I thought mm. to myself in my head, right, 10 years, mm. Let's see what where we can take the business and then I'll look at my personal life and what's going on and think about having a family. So I never like wanted to be a young mum anyway. So I was on track timeline wise, but just not in the conventional yeah. way. I had the test, dire situation, spoke to my brother. Um, and and I'd always said tongue in cheek, like even when my mum was still here, I was like, well, if I don't find someone, I'll just do it on my own. Yeah. Um, it's possible. Um, so spoke to my brother and I was like, yeah, I, I'm doing it. Like that's the final decision. Um, so I guess the technical term is to become a solo parent. Um, and, I, and I said, but I'll just leave it six months so we can get the business to a certain yeah. point. Because it was in the like middle of this situation we're talking about. And Philip was like, no, because Philip would rather have a <clears> business <throat> a third of the size and me be happy and get what I want out of life. Um, then that not happened. So he was like, no, if you're going to do it, just crack on with it because time's not on your side almost. So that decision was made like back end of 2017. So the whole of 2018, which is the time frame that you're talking yeah. about, um, I was trying to, for a baby. I got eight no's before I got a yes. I didn't really have any breaks in between. My consultant thought I was absolutely nuts because um, he was like, it's going to take a break. You're going to take a bit of a breath. I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm going for it. And then when I told him I was going to take a break, he went, all right, so should we check it in a few months? So I went, no, no, I'm just going to have a month off and then I'm going to try again. And he kind of quite quickly got a judge of my character. Yeah. Then I had all the no's, the emotional, the physical, the mental bit. I could not have anticipated. And every point where there was a bit of a glimmer of hope that it might work, something else went wrong. Yeah. And it was mm. like that for, well, when did I get, when did I find out with Ruby? For about 15 months, something like that, which actually, if you were trying for a baby in a conventional way, yeah. it's not that long. But yeah. in the way that I was doing it, through kind of IVF and, and, a, and a different version of IVF, yeah. it's, it's, it, it is a lot in a very short period of time, a lot of drugs, it's it's pretty relentless. How How did you get through that? period was it the purpose and the drive and the commitment to you just to having a child or because I, I know what it's like like you give somebody as a as a business owner or, or whatever and when people throw it back at you it's really personal mm. and people think it's not and the people go oh he probably 
you know, it, it, they'll be all right because they're doing all right or they've yeah. got this or they've got that. But it doesn't matter any of that. It really mm. affects you. You're now supercharged yeah. emotionally on all this. How, 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 how did you keep going month after month after month for 15 um, months? Because I just think, well, what's the alternative almost? Mm. Like... When, when you're right in the middle of it, and I've got to know and something else went wrong or whatever else in terms of trying to become a mum, you have like, and I remember it, you have like a week or so of, I can't do this again. I just mm. cannot put myself through this again. But then you kind of, I don't know, you get your head around it and you're like, but ultimately I want to be a mum and I'm not, I'm not going to give up. So, mm. and, and that not give up mentality is a relatively common theme. Um most things I would say in my life, all sorts of things from the little stuff to the big stuff, doesn't work for the first time. Right, well, I'll go again until I get mm. what I want effectively. Mm. Um, so it was that kind of attitude that that's my plan and until I am told medically I cannot be a mum, and I wasn't told I couldn't, but I was told it was going to be difficult, yeah. then I will, I will keep going. There was a woman that I remember, we still do a bit of work with now, a resilience code, and there were times when I was like, you know, not in a good place because yeah. of it. And <clears throat> she was she was really good and we had quite a lot of sessions around resilience. Um, and obviously I've got my brother and, and I've got my sister, We've, we're a close family. So there was lots of support from that perspective, but it was awful because every time something went wrong, I just saw the look in my brother's and my sister's eyes because mm. they wanted it for me mm. so much, mm. but nobody knew if and when it was going to happen mm. almost. And at night when you close your front door, it's just you, in it? Yeah, yeah. And what's it like? Um, well... <clears throat> really hard and, mm. and, it, and but that was really hard when I was trying when I was pregnant yeah um even now yeah. like even now with a three and a half year old in a business you know it is of you know I'm human like anybody else mm. while some people think I'm not I'm more of a robot I'm human like anyone mm. else you want a cuddle you want yeah. someone to say it's going to be okay you want a sounding board that's the thing that I don't have yeah I don't have that immediate sounding board in mm. any aspect of my life where I can go I have people around me yeah. you know I've spoken to you about stuff yeah. speak to my brother I've got yeah. loads of people but not at home where you can go what do you reckon did I do the right thing will it work yeah did I overreact to Ruby so that's probably the hardest thing that I've not got that immediate sounding board and certainly yeah. when I was going through it I just had to keep the focus that was I'm going to do it and this relentless drive to not accept no and yeah. to never give up Where's that come from? Do you know what? It's a hard one. You had Maggie Alfonso on mm. speaking a few mm. months ago, um, and <clears throat> I got quite emotional. No one saw the emotions that time. They have more recently in one of your sessions. But mm. I got quite emotional when she was talking about why, because the easy, the easy thing to say is, I want to maximise my, my potential. I do. Um, I want to stand out in my industry. I do, because it's, you know, it's not got a great reputation. And now Ruby and being a role model, and we'll come back onto that, is massive. But actually, when I looked at my why, I guess there's two things. There's one, I never want to go back to the place that I was when I was 10, 11, 12, when my dad died and we had nothing. Mm -hmm. um, it was awful. And my mum did the best she possibly mm. could. And like, unbelievable what she did. Um, but I just don't want to ever go back to that place. Like, why would I? And yeah. that isn't about, oh, because I want, I didn't have money and I want money now. Well, Money does give you choices and opportunities, but it was the, <clears throat> the mental stress that went with that. I never want to go back to that place. And I guess, you know, I, like I want to make my mum proud. Now, that's a really difficult why to have when mum isn't here anymore. Mm. And I say mum more than dad just because I lost my dad when I was so young that the relationship there was limited in comparison to what I had with my mum. So because she gave everything and put like everything once my dad died to all of us but specifically me and Gemma because we were so young I feel like I've got a real debt almost that I need to repay to absolutely make sure I absolutely smash life and I've got one opportunity so why am I not going to maximize it almost so those are like the two obvious whys um there's a little bit of proving myself which is dangerous to me, but also maybe to those people at school who made me feel a bit like shit. Yeah. Um, because their parents were wealthy. Well, there's a little bit of now, I'm going to be honest with you, where to some of them, I put two fingers up to them in my own head because I'm like, I didn't have it all, but yeah. look what I've managed to achieve. Yeah. Um, so there's, 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 there's loads at play in terms of 
I guess what my why is. But now I've got Ruby. I think my brother thought when I had Ruby, I might mellow. Yeah. It's not happened. Right. If anything, it's gone up about 10 notches right. because I've just got, well, I've got someone who's dependent on me 100% of the time. Yeah. And that pressure is amazing, <clears throat> but it's also, um, it's also really hard as well because I am her world. The, the, her immediate world yeah. is just me. Yeah. So I, I need to provide for her. Um, I need to be there for her emotionally. Um, I need to create a certain life that I want for us both. I need to be a role model for her because mm. um, I do want her to believe that you can be and do anything yeah. that you want to. So I think <clears> there's <throat> loads in there, um, but I'm also so bloody minded and strong willed if somebody tells me that something's difficult that just makes me want to go and do it even more you told me a couple of years ago in a meeting I came in and I'm thinking we're doing fucking great here we're smashing it the financials yeah. are great and then you go they are but look at your balance sheet and I was like right okay I was like what does it need to be you told me and I remember three months later yeah. Paul I've done that yeah. and do you know what when you run a business Philip and I are accountable to each other but sometimes you need that external push because that's what makes me almost deliver yeah. so I don't know I probably answered yeah. the question in, in multiple ways there but there's loads of stuff that yeah. Yeah. just makes me not accept what? anything other than smashing Succeeding, it I guess yeah. yeah yeah what was the um Obviously, you had a positive outcome after 15 months. What yeah. was what was that like when you um, when, when you got out. the news? Yeah. Oh my god! Like I I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. It was I'd had mm. um, I won't go into a biology lesson, but I had six mm. attempts at IUI, which is effectively a less intrusive version of IVF. Right. It mm. was the first round of IVF where I got pregnant, but I had three embryos, and it was the final one. So because it was the third and final embryo, and it was therefore the worst quality because they put the best quality one in first. Yeah. I'd kind of written it off, which was probably a bit of a protective mechanism, yeah. but I'd written it off because it was towards the end of like 18 and I thought, do you know what? Like, I'm just gonna have to go again and do another round next year. Um, there were some things I think I did, to be fair, that <clears throat> potentially helped me get pregnant that time, but I'd written it off and it was 4 a.m. I woke up in the morning and I was like, right, I'm doing a pregnancy test. I'd not tested before and in some of the other times I'd tested too early and I thought, no, no, no going to do it so I tested at 4am and it came through pregnant and I literally could not believe it like it gives me shivers now thinking about yeah. it got in the shower it's like right I'm getting ready and I went round to my sisters who lived in Preston and yeah. knocked on the door at 6am yeah. then I went round to my brothers then I went round to my elder sisters like an absolute psycho yeah. but it was just yeah it was just an amazing moment and I and you know I needed to share it with with somebody so yeah it I can remember it like yesterday how long was it amazing for and then did, did that kind of feeling move to a fear then of... Go yeah, on. so it's interesting because <laughs> you don't know this bit, actually. So I found out I was pregnant. So, like, when you find out you're pregnant, you're four yeah. weeks or whatever. And then the next two weeks, elated, unbelievable, buzzing, couldn't believe it. Honest answer, week six to week 16, horrendous. Um, from a mental health perspective, yeah. which is something that I, I, I have struggled with um, and, and still do. Um, it was horrendous. Like can't explain it to you I'm like I've tried for 15 months to get pregnant I'm now pregnant and I feel this bad like this can't be happening to me mm. it was absolutely horrendous mm. spoke to my midwife and I was like is this normal and then she talked I was still on like progesterone um from IVF so you still take quite a lot of um yeah. drugs <clears throat> up until 13 weeks yeah so she was like right just take a breath if at the 16 week mark you're still feeling like this obviously we'll need to have a conversation and see what we can do um but just go easy on yourself in this time on the like apps you do for like um being a mum and you get all these apps and stuff one of them talks about mental health and pre and postnatal and it actually said i can't remember the exact stat but women that have gone through ivf are so much more likely to have prenatal depression because of almost that emotion and build up leading up to it and then the reality and and I was like, that actually makes sense. But I didn't even know, even though prenatal depression existed. And I was like, oh, honestly, I was like, I can't feel like this. Anyway, 16 week mark felt amazing. It was bizarre. So from 16 weeks, really, for the rest of my pregnancy, yeah. I had a really good pregnancy. I was right. pretty high energy. The last few weeks, knackered. I was massive and I'm small. So yeah, everything hurt and stuff. But um, no, I was, I was excited. Once I started to feel better, I was excited. I had a gender reveal. Um, so that was quite exciting. And a girl was just perfect given what I'm like. And I don't know, having her on my own and stuff. Yeah. It was just, it was just all fell into place. Um, 
I thought much more about the logistical side of being a mum, though, on my own. So childcare. Yeah. I had an I had a meeting with a nanny before I was even pregnant. She thought I was not. She was like, "So when when are you due?" I went, oh, "I'm not pregnant yet," and she was like, "Right." I said, "I'm just getting all my ducks in a row because I wanted a night nanny to support me a couple of nights a week when Ruby was really young." Because I knew, off, I know what I'm like with no sleep. So I thought seven nights continually, no sleep, no chance. Yeah. So I met her and I said, can you do two nights a week? She went, in theory, yeah, but like, I don't even know when she, you're going to get pregnant or yeah. she's going to be yeah. here. I went, no, no, I, I just need it set up. So got all my ducks in a row logistically, childcare support network, all the rest of it. <clears throat> um, and then probably what I didn't really get my head around was more like the mental health side not postnatal depression I didn't get that thankfully but just like the mental health aspect of being a mum I probably didn't prepare myself for that very well yeah so Ruby arrives in 2019 July 19 yeah um the business at this point so from 2018 to 2019 how's that moved while you know from Um, our meeting to to Ruby It didn't get worse, um, but we took a couple of people on when I um, was, like, due to go on mat leave and on mat leave, and they didn't work out. Quite senior hires, um, so that took a lot of my brother's time. So, yeah, it didn't get worse, Mm. and we managed to get some external investment as well, actually, debt investment, Mm. which provided Mm. a little bit of a buffer, Um, but it wasn't in the best place ever Mm. as I was due to return in Jan 2020. Right. And so... How do you immediately, you've got a little one, it's just you. Yeah. How do you, um, what's been, What's the parenting side of it been like? Because bad enough for me. Yeah. But I, I've got I have got a partner that mm. I rely on. I feel guilty about that, by the way. I feel guilty yeah. about that because because I've got it, I use it. You use it, yeah. Right? So that comes with mental, um, mental quandaries, yeah. should we say. But what's it like for you? Because as you've just said, Ruby, you are, Ruby's got you. Mm. Yeah. How's that been? Um, Amazingly good and amazingly hard in equal measure. Mm -hmm. Somebody said to me when I was about 36 weeks pregnant, I was like, pick your timing, but he was right, that kids will take you to places you've never been before, both amazing and horrendous. And honestly, that is the best bit of advice anyone's given me because then it's meant when that's happened, I've been like, oh my God, that's what he meant. So unbelievable. Like the relationship we have now is so intense in such, like... It sounds really pathetic to say this, but it's the only way I can articulate it. Like, how much I love her, it hurts sometimes. Like, Mm. that's how I feel about her. Um, And the things she says now are unbelievable, but it is hard in a way I could never have anticipated. Um, I have no patience, zero tolerance, not ideal as a parent. Mm. Um, My life is full. I don't stop. Um, I'm not great at being present. Um... No sounding board, that's a massive thing. My, my brother's amazing. He's really rational. He's yeah. got three kids. He sees how mm. Ruby can be when I'm there and it is hard work and she's really high maintenance. Um, so he's really good at kind of like talking me through stuff. But no sounding board. So when I lose my shit with her, which I'm human, I do, and she drives me mad and I literally have to go in another room until I calm down, there's no one to go, just take her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or <clears throat> just, Claire, just chill out that's hard and my brother sent me an amazing text a few months ago and I was having a really difficult time and everything he said was right and it's like but you've got to be mum and dad and he was kind of saying when Vicky his wife um his wife gets mad with the kids and gets up here she can go Phil it comes in and it annoys her because it's like oh now you come in and everything's fine but I don't have that and that is from a mindset not like mental health in terms of low depressed Mm. whatever but just like mentally dealing with that and coming down from how much she stressed me out to then having to just clear it and pretend everything's okay i find that really hard um really difficult there are benefits though what i say goes there's nobody to contradict or to challenge my decisions, which is okay. You can argue, well, maybe you yeah. need that, but yeah. do you know what? There's no one to disappoint me. There's no one to get frustrated with. You know, I've got friends who say that the parent, that the, the dad's parenting style is different and it does the head in. Um, you know, one, par- one, one, one of my mum friend jokes and says, if 
ex was your husband, he'd be under your patio because he'd just do your wedding. Because yeah. my expectations, if somebody was doing this with me, mm. they're doing it with me. And they'd be doing it 50-50 because I've got a business and a career and that's yeah. as important, you know, it's not as important, yeah. but it's, it's a very yeah. close second to yeah. Ruby. Yeah. So my expectations in terms of what a partner would do are, are high and arguably unrealistic. Um, so there's lots of things like that mm. that actually are easier i've created a framework for myself where every other week or a routine i should say every other week ruby stays over at a nanny's so i tie that in with an event through work yeah a night out i should probably just have nights to myself and chill out but i still like a night out mm. just because my mum doesn't mm. mean i don't want to do that bit so there are things like that that i can do that actually if i was doing doing it with a partner would actually be quite difficult yeah we went to iceland on the retreat three yeah. uh, three weeks ago probably now for a weekend do you feel guilty when you're there? Or are you okay with that? No, I do. I do. Because she's also older now, so she gets it. Yeah. So she's like, where are you going? Mummy, I'm going on a work trip. Mummy, can I come with you? Well, well, no, that doesn't really work that way, Ruby. So I do feel guilty, not to the extent that it stops me, but also I know who she's with. She loves spending time with. So she was with the nanny for two nights. Um, she was with my brother and my sister. So whilst I've had to be quite flexible in terms of childcare and who looks after it, it's a pretty close unit. I would never just ring up a nanny agency and go, Ruby needs babysitting tonight. Like everyone that looks after her, she knows and she's she's super comfortable yeah. with. Um, but also I need that space and, and that time. The thing that I feel most guilty about, if I'm honest with you, is how inconsistent I am with her. Um, because at times... I think I'm I think I'm amazing and I look at myself and I'm like do you know what for everything that I've got in my life mm. and some of the crap I've gone through with losing parents running a business whatever I think do you know what I look at her and I'm like I'm doing a good job but then there's other times when I think to myself oh my god I could be doing so much better I've mm. lost my shit I, I project how I think onto Ruby she doesn't think like a 39 year old does she's three <laughs> so like yeah. I, like so yeah. so that's what I feel guilty about how yeah. inconsistent I am with her yeah but I don't think that's specific just to me doing no. it on my own. I think most parents probably feel the same. 100%. So let's talk, let's go back to the business now. Yeah. So um, Ruby's born in 2019, yeah. COVID happens, but let's, we won't dwell too yeah. much on the COVID. Yeah. It's been done to death. Let's talk about kind of the resurgence of the business yeah. over the period of yeah. time and, and the things you had a, probably a poisonous culture heading into that period, mm. coming out of it. What's it look like now? Yeah, I mean, it's we're in such a different place. It's mm. amazing. So <clears throat> if we go back to three years ago, we're triple the size. We were almost in terms of headcount, certainly in terms of revenue and turnover. Of course, we benefited from a buoyant market, like you said yep. earlier, recruitment's doing pretty well yep. at the moment. But there's lots of stuff that we've done as a business that I think has contributed towards that. So yeah, let's not dwell on COVID, but we made some pretty brave decisions. We brought people back really quickly. Um, you've got to speculate to accumulate in what we do. And I got a feeling from clients that things were starting to move quite quick. So mm. we brought people back early. We continued to recruit, even when other businesses were thinking, shit, should, should we be doing that? We've invested really heavily in marketing. Mm. We focused a lot on our purpose and our why as a business. So we did a whole workshop on that at the end of 2020. But why do we do what we do? What's important to us? Um, we've started to refine our sales strategy. So rather than we'll recruit for any client in the Northwest in certain areas, we want to work with really great businesses that prioritize the people and culture. Um, my role's changed to from sales director to managing director. So there's been a lot more focus on strategy, growth, revenue streams. Um, God, what if we, we've, we've launched new divisions, we've launched new commercial products. There's just a ambition behind it in the last two to three years that there's not been before. Yeah. Um, and, and that isn't saying that we weren't ambitious, by the way, we were. But when you set up a business, you get all this noise around you. You're selling three to five mm. years time. Mm. You don't, mm. and you might not want to. Mm. And mm. from five to 10 years, I kind of still told myself this, but I actually didn't believe it, if I'm honest with you, because we just were the same as we've always been. Yeah. We didn't really do things differently. We weren't yeah. any bigger. And I'm thinking, we're not. That, that's not gonna happen, whereas now, now we, the business is where it is, I know we can double it in the next two years yeah. in terms of headcount, revenue, et cetera. And then mm -hmm. once we've done that, 
I'm pretty certain we, we can go again. Like, I've just, I don't know, I've focused a lot on my own kind of development as well yeah, yeah. because I am far from the finished article. Mm. Um, but there's, there's, there's just a fire behind it and a determination that I, I, there wasn't previously. In terms of the, you mentioned the marketing, the, the whole business has become, from the outside, from me looking in, just a lot more polished. Yeah. A lot a lot more polished, a mm. lot a lot more of a business, a lot more, co I wouldn't say corporate in a sort of, a bit like us, we're moving corporate, but we're never going to be corporate, yeah, corporate, yeah. but polished is probably a yeah. better word. Um, but at the forefront of that is, is you mm. as well as an individual. So what are the kind of things you, you've, you're building, you, you built your own brand. What are the kind of things that you're aiming to do with your own brand? Um, so me personally. Yeah. Um, so this is an interesting one. I absolutely love the business and, and what we've done and all the client side and working with businesses and helping them grow the teams. Love all of that. But actually, there's loads more stuff that I'm passionate about and I'm I speak about other subjects quite a bit, so mental health, yeah. the whole fertility side of things for me is absolutely massive because of what I've gone through, but we've got 80% women. I don't want any of my team to come to me and apologise for the fact that they're pregnant. Yeah. And do you know what? The last person actually did, despite my right. situation, yeah. because there's, there's just this culture around it. It's mm. crazy. Any business owner, you're going to agree with this, if key people in your business are going to go on maternity leave, obviously you need to find a solution because yeah. otherwise yeah. like, they won't be a key person in your business. But, oh my God, it's it's like it's something to be celebrated, mm. not seen mm. as a negative. Mm. So I'm really passionate about the whole kind of female health, fertility side of things and the whole women in business, not in a burn your bra um, and don't want this to come across the wrong way, but annoying feminist way, just in a, just believe in equality. And I don't think there are anywhere near enough females still Agreed. who are maximising the potential in the way that we could. We talk about be the standard. Yeah. I don't think you'll mind me saying, no. but you've got three female members in the group. Now, there's no surprise because that really reflects the business world out there because yeah. when you said to me, well, you know, absolutely, if you know people, and I'm thinking, don't actually know that many other people. I did a panel a couple of weeks ago for female FDs and CFOs. I asked one of my team about, right, who do we know? Up and coming, mm. aspir aspiring accountants, let's get some events. She looked at her client base, hardly any. Yeah. And it's like, that is crazy. Mm. So women in business, mental health, I'm really passionate about, um, fertility, and um, anything now, I'm not going to lie, child-related, now I've got Ruby and... You know that you, I texted you a few weeks ago about a few days ago about the Santa appeal, like just anything around that. Not that I didn't have an empathy before, but yeah. now when you've got your own, it just takes on another stage. So that space is kind of arguably where I want to be in, as much as growing the business, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Well, coming towards the end now, what what does the future look like for for four and yeah. for you? Yeah. So for four. Like I say, we've got some pretty aggressive in a, in a, in a positive way yeah. growth plans that take us to the end of 2024 yeah. within the divisions that we've got and kind of increasing the number of people we've got in our team, et cetera. So we've got that. We're looking at launching two new revenue streams yeah. um, in the first half of next year, which actually will be all around our four HR brand, which is the strongest brand in its own right. So we've got those two things, yeah. um, which are quite exciting. Yeah. They'll all feed into each other, but sure. they're two separate revenue streams. Um, we've really done a lot of work internally in terms of our kind of um organizational design i guess to create capacity for philip and i and yeah. um, to allow us to scale <clears> the business <throat> further we appointed a non-exec which is actually through an intro effectively yeah. through yeah. yourself yeah. um someone that spoke at one of your events a few months ago i think he's going to be amazing in yeah. terms of helping us grow the business yeah. um and i guess for me personally there's, there literally are not enough hours in a day, so I definitely need to create some capacity to be able to do this, but yeah. I want to do some stuff in the areas that I've talked about. Yeah. Um, and it's not really a secret that I would absolutely love to give Ruby a brother or sister, whether yeah. I can or not yeah. remains to be seen, yeah. um, but I'd really love to. And whilst that might sound crazy, given how yeah. you know challenging yeah. and full my life is, yeah. You know, we hear a lot, don't we? And it's not about being morbid, but when you're on your deathbed, what you want to, you know, when you look back, what you, what am I going to want to do? Yeah. Have more millions of pounds on the bottom line or read Ruby more bedtime stories and 
do all the stuff we did at the weekend to do with Christmas and all that really magical stuff. It is, I know, right now, I'm torn. I'm not going to lie, yeah. it's difficult sometimes, but yeah. I know I'm going to look back and, it, <clears> and it's going to be the latter. It's going to be the stuff to do with kids. And if I don't at least try to give Ruby or a brother or sister, that's going to be a huge regret. And I don't, I don't want to yeah. live with regrets. I think it's a great outlook on life to look at the end and work your way back. Um, not a lot of people do that. Some people do, not a lot of people do. Do you think that coming all the way back to the start of this mm. podcast where you talked about your dad, mm. do you think that kind of tragedy, if you like, has led to this kind of incessant, relentless mindset to just live life to its absolute fullest? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, because there's been so many things that have indicate how fragile life is and it's you know we're all guilty of this I set a reminder in my phone every day at 7 30 um because I'm guilty of it every day and it says make it count don't get frustrated with Ruby she's three um and but but, but this is because I know how I can yeah. fall into these things yeah. don't get frustrated with Ruby because she's three um and you've got one chance so why would you not live it and, and that and that is kind of and, and does that mean sometimes I fall on my ass a bit? Yeah, because I live life so full and I do so much that that catches up with me, it, mm. and it does. Mm. Um, but I, I have ways that I try and put stuff in every two three months to try and have that time out for me. Um, but absolutely, if I hadn't have lost mum and dad, I don't think. I'd be where I am today. I don't think I'd have set a business up. I don't think I'd have had the de determination. And I don't know if I'd have had Ruby in the way that I'd have had her um, because there's just too many reminders all around me that, like, we're here today, we could be gone tomorrow. Mm. I've gone through, a, a, not super close, but a, a really recent bereavement only two days ago in the family. And not that my family needs a reminder of how fragile life is, but, again, it just makes... It puts everything into perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, my, you, the, tr the tragedy that happened when I was young certainly contributes to the decisions that I've made. So, God, if there's going to be anything good coming out of loss, then then, then you'd hope this would be it, I guess. Yeah. Make every day count. We'll leave it there. Yeah. Thanks for coming Set on, Claire. Set it as a reminder in your phone. Yeah, thank you very much for coming <laughs> no, thanks on. thanks for having Enjoyed me. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.